Okay, thanks. Yeah, thanks for having us. Uh, really happy to be here. Um, let me get my screen share going. Uh, to present some slides. We don't present slides very often at Amazon. Uh, so I think this might be the third time I've ever presented slides at Amazon. So, uh, so this is a special treat. So yeah, thanks again for having us. My name's Chandler. Um, I'm, I'm the GM for uh, EKS Anywhere at AWS. And then Joey is a software engineer on our team who will be doing the demo today. Um, I wanna start by just explaining what EKS Anywhere is. Um, it all started a couple years ago uh, when we, we started getting requests from customers who are, are happy running Kubernetes workloads in EKS. And those customers said, hey, can you help me run Kubernetes workloads in my own data center? I have a lot of workloads that I can't move to EKS uh, or to the cloud yet. And I, I need some help running Kubernetes there. And it, it was as simple as that. Uh, Amazon is pretty good about responding to customer asks. And so uh, teams get funded and projects get funded and, and out comes EKS anywhere. Um, and the way we approached it is we actually started with a different project. And if you've been following along, uh, we launched EKS Distro last reInvent, last December or so. Um, and EKS Distro is essentially just the, the core bits and uh, binaries and container images that we would consider that makes up like Kubernetes. It's about 15, 20 different container images, you know, the Kube API server, um, etcd, et cetera, just what we would consider like the core set of images and binaries. And it's the exact same run ones we run under the covers with EKS. Um, as many of you know, EKS is in no way ever going to be a fork, um, but we do apply some patches, uh, you know, there's some security patches, some operational patches, things that are waiting to get upstreamed, things like that. And then we also version certain components slightly different. We might we might pull a different version of etcd uh, down that that the upstream doesn't recommend um, because we want some performance feature or something like that. So so we wanted to publish EKS Distro to give you the exact same experience as far as the underlying bits and and uh, and images goes that you get with EKS. So if you're running a platform on prem you can run it in EKS distro mode by pulling those, those images uh, from, from our builds. So that was EKS distro. And then we built on top of that uh, with EKS Anywhere. And EKS Anywhere is that really that full-fledged on-premise Kubernetes platform. And that has an installer based on cluster API, and it has um, you know, a default CNI that we ship with it. And over time, it'll have more and more components that we pull from the open source community that we would ship by default. And that's a fully supported product um, supported by AWS, all the components, um, every open source component, every component that gets shipped is supported by AWS. Um, it's also an open source project on GitHub, uh, Apache 2 licensed. And, um, and yeah, that's, that's, our, that's our product. So uh, now looking at kind of how this fits into the AWS Kubernetes, this is what this slide's about. Really, how does this fit into the AWS Kubernetes offerings? Um, you pretty much have every checkbox now as far as managed offerings from AWS to customer managed Kubernetes offerings. So on one side of the scale on the far right here, you would have, you know, you could run EKS with Fargate where you give us your container and you just deploy it onto EKS with Fargate. Um, you could run EKS with managed node groups where, you know, you manage the, the worker nodes um, you could run EKS where we just manage the control plane and you bring your own worker nodes. And then if you're like, okay, well, I want to run Kubernetes in my own data center, you could run EKS on outposts. Um, and we're also coming out with an offering where you can run EKS on outposts where the control plane and the worker nodes run on the outposts. Because the way EKS works today is that the control plane runs in, in an AWS region and just the worker nodes run on your outposts. And then if you say, okay, I don't want outposts. I just want to run this on my own hardware. Um, then you can run EKS anywhere. And if you say, okay, I don't want to use your platform. I want to use my own, you know, uh, Kubernetes distribution. Then we say, okay, well, you could use EKS distro under the covers there. So I think we've checked almost every box. Uh, it's a lot of boxes there. Um, but that's kind of the scale. That's the way I, I think about it. My brain works where AWS managed all the way down to the customer managed and everything in between. Um, so the, the use cases, someone asked the use cases for Azure Arc earlier. I mean, our use cases are, are really built around customers who, who have existing investments in on-premise infrastructure, or 
um, and or they, they have reasons that they can't move to the cloud, certain workloads that they can't move to the cloud. And this is just a couple of reasons. Um, if, you, if you really start thinking about it, there's actually a lot of reasons people are still gonna run workloads on-prem. You might have a cruise ship in the middle of the Atlantic who doesn't have good uh, uh, you know, bandwidth at all times. And, and they actually basically run floating data centers. Um, you might have a very sensitive data center with you know highly secure information in it that they want to keep completely air gapped with no access to the internet at all. Somebody might want to do that. You might have an offshore you know oil platform or something like this that um, that that doesn't also have good connectivity. And then you might have governance reasons. You might have finance institutions. Um, you know we've talked to some some foreign national countries uh, that are basically have these requirements now that if you know political events got weird, they could shut off everything outside of their country and still be able to run their core um, workloads you know, inside their country. So they want to have their own data centers there um, and be able to run their own workloads there. So there's actually dozens and dozens of reasons why people would continue to want to run workloads on premise. And we want to help them with all of those reasons. Um, so, so what is, EKS Anywhere exactly. Um, as I explained earlier, it's building on EKS Distro, um, but it's essentially a, a, a cluster installer, um, cluster lifecycle manager um, that, that is built, as I mentioned earlier, on top of Cluster API. We're really excited about that project. And then we bundle it with some, what we would consider basic components. Um, but then over time, we're going to add a lot more functionality to this. Um, but we started with Two, two really key third-party tools, um, one being Cilium, which is our third-party CNI that we bundle by default. And then the second thing being Flux, which is how we really recommend people interact with their cluster, not just here, but any Kubernetes cluster. Um, we really feel like the old imperative ways of doing things where you type in a command and then hope for the best and hope that your cluster doesn't go down, or if it does go down, you remember all the commands you typed. We, we're trying to do away with that, and we're trying to steer people towards more of a declarative approach. Obviously, that's that's why you're all are here because you're probably interested in hearing about that. And Joey will dem demonstrate that in a second how that works with with EKS anywhere. Um, but over time, we'll we'll bundle a lot of other things, um, and then this runs today on top of VMware vSphere, uh, and we're adding support for uh, CloudStack, which is another. Uh, open source virtualization platform. And we're also adding support for bare metal. And both those things are coming uh, early next year. And over time, we could potentially add support for other providers for cluster API as well as customers ask for things. It just becomes a you know, roadmap prioritization exercise. Um, so yeah, that's EKS Anywhere. Hope that makes sense. I'm happy to answer more questions about that after Joey's demo. Um, and then again, we talked about the value prop. This is all about running it on your own infrastructure. Um, we also are looking at ways to help customers with what the edge, which is a very loaded term, obviously, but infrastructure that might be smaller, a smaller footprint than a full data center. Um, and then it's, it's really built around helping EKS customers and on-prem. We're, we're less focused on, on uh, customers running on multiple clouds, we're really more focused on EKS customers who have on-premise use cases. And then a one-stop shop for all the support uh, if you so choose to purchase that. The, the product itself is fully open source. Anyone can download it and use it today. But if you want support, you know, you, that's what you pay for. Okay, so here's another look at all the components we, we packaged into it um, so far. And again, you know, it's a V1. Um, we have a lot, a lot more things we, we want to do and, and we're, we're pretty excited about our roadmap, which we'll also be making public on, on our GitHub roadmap uh, shortly. So with that, um, I think I, I did my five minutes. With that, I will pass it over to Joey to do a demo of how this all works. Yep, that sounds good. Okay, let me share my screen here. All right. Um, hey guys, I'm Joey and um, I'm a software engineer from Amazon EKS Anywhere. So today, before we jump into the demo, I'd like to give you a brief overview of how EKS Anywhere integrated with Flux and how we use GitOps to manage and update a EKS Anywhere Kubernetes cluster. So at EKS Anywhere, we want to meet 
developers like you, where you are. There is a long list of things you should already know ahead. First, Kubernetes. Second, Git. And that's it. So we're building a command line tool that is meant to be simple and boring to provide an easy but robust way to install Kubernetes anywhere in VMs, on bare metal, or any other environment. Um, as customers use Kubernetes for more of their infrastructure management needs, they often have to create and run multiple clusters across cloud providers and on-prem locations. And using kubectl offers a lot of control and immediate feedback, but it's rather hard to audit, to recover, and trace. So in recent years, AWS come up with many infrastructure frameworks such as CloudFormation and CDK that popularize the idea of version controlled stack to manage infrastructure. This analog, in my opinion, should be carried over to the Kubernetes world where EKS Anywhere can offer similar advantages over these ad hoc modifications made using kubectl. So for this purpose, we adopt GitOps methodology that uses Git as a single source of choose to manage pretty much everything in the cluster, which includes like the cluster config, the underlying infrastructure, and also customer applications in a declarative fashion. Um, so people build website or even writing books on Git. It is the most popular version control system today. It's all about um, who changed what and when. So managing a Kubernetes cluster should not be different. It should be natural, standard, and traceable. So here on the left side is a diagram of our cluster creation workflow. The user simply need to define a cluster spec YAML file along with some um, flux configurations and that such as repository name, username, if it's a personal account or not. And they can just run the ECAS cuddle anywhere create command. After the workload cluster get created um, as a post installation step, we will bootstrap flux and install at CRDs and components such as um, the source controller, the customization, Helm and notification controller to the Flux system namespace. And we will also install our EKS Anywhere CRDs and a cluster controller that keeps the EKS Anywhere cluster status in sync with the underlying cluster API components, which we rely on for um, provisioning and the operation of the cluster. And finally, the cluster spec file will then be pushed into the remote Git repo we specified along with the Flux system components. So this is how the files get laid out in the Git repo. For instance, the EKS A cluster YAML will carry the main cluster config resources as well as the GitOps config where it specify the basic fields such as honors, the repo name, things like that. And uh, in the Flux system directory, the Flux patches file allow us to bootstrap Flux with customization where we can use our self-hosted Flux controller images in Amazon ECR. And uh, there is a read-only Flux components file that defines the Flux CRDs as well as the deployment for Flux controllers. Now, whenever, we want to update the cluster. The only thing we'll need to do is to update this cluster spec file, then push it to the Git repo. The Flux controller will then detect the source changes in the repo, apply those changes to the EKS Anywhere custom resources in the cluster, only if the change passes the EKS A webhook validation. And our cluster controller will then start the reconciliation process where it parses the cluster config, update the cluster API spec, and applies it into the ECAS Anywhere cluster. So we can then just have an updated cluster 
that matches the one we described in the Git repo. Um, now, I'd like to walk you through a demo I recorded last week. To save some time, I sped up some parts of the video, for example, during the create cluster command, which usually takes 10 to 15 minutes to provision a three control plane and three worker node cluster on vSphere. And um, I'm going to demonstrate the actual user experience about how we create a Flux enabled cluster on vSphere using our command line tool and how we can manage that cluster in the GitOps way. So let me switch. Um, so the first thing we do is to define a cluster spec file. Here we call it eksa-demo.yaml file. And for example here, I want to create a cluster with three control plane node, three external SCD, and one worker node. Um, each one of them has a machine group ref, which in this case points to a vSphere machine config that you will see after. Um, I also have the data center ref that includes all the vSphere data center configurations. You can see here, I can also set up my CNI in this case. I use Cilium as my cluster networking interface. I define which Kubernetes version I want to be using or whether I want to use a local registry or not when pulling the images. And here in the bottom, I also have the GitOps section where it points to a GitOps config resource. So next page here. Specifically for vSphere data center, I provide things like server address, network, some print, et cetera. And for control plane, worker nodes and SCD, I also define all the infrastructure settings such as data store, folder, um, CPU memory disk, and um, SSH key I can use later to access the nodes. And uh, finally here, for the GitOps config, I choose Flux as my GitOps tool. And in it, I have GitHub as my Git provider. I specify my GitHub username and repo name, whether it's a personal account or organization. Notice here um, that the repo does not need to exist ahead. The CLI will simply create one for the user if it's not there. And um, there are also some optional parameters that are not listed here where, where user can specify things like customized Flux system namespace, which branch to use, the cluster config pass, things like that. So we go ahead, save the file. And we can export the vSphere username, the password, and for Flux, we also export the GitHub personal access token. Then we go ahead and run the EKS cuddle anywhere create cluster command. And we pass in the cluster spec file we just defined. We run the command. And uh, by the logs here, you can see we first do some pre fly checks we validate if the GitHub access token has a required repo permission for us and Flux to commit and push to the repo. We then validate the provider environment, check if the Flux cluster config pass is valid or not. And then we create a bootstrap cluster, which is a temporary cluster we use to provision a target workload cluster. Then the cluster API controllers on this bootstrap cluster will create the actual workflow cluster on vSphere, which is the actual Kubernetes clustering that the end customer will be using. So after both control plane and worker nodes are in ready state, we then install Flux components on that workflow cluster. Um, we set up the Git repo, we push our cluster spec YAML there, and deploy our EKS Anywhere cluster controller. 
but in the end, we will just move the cluster API components from the Bootstrap cluster to the target workload cluster so that later on we can still utilize cluster API to run other operations like cluster upgrade and delete. Um, now the cluster command, create command succeed. Let's, um, let's point a kubeconfig file to the cluster we just created. We can simply run kubectl get nodes. You can see I have three control plane, one worker nodes, all in ready state. And kubectl get machines. You will see the actual vSphere machines that are provisioned for most ads, CD, for control plane, and for the worker nodes. And of course, you can run kubectl get pods. You see here, except the default kube system components, we also have the cluster API and provider specific components spin up here. And all the flux controllers under the flux namespace. And we also have the EKS Anywhere cluster controller all deployed into the workload cluster we just created. And let's switch to the vSphere UI console here. It is pretty clear to see the actual VMs being provisioned and spinned up. You can also check the VMs back in there for network, for resource, for things like that. We can also install some resources and use ECAS connector to connect this cluster to the ECAS console. Um, I'm just fast forwarding this part here, but you can see when I refresh the page, this EKS8 demo cluster will show up. You can easily check all the pods that are running in each node, like the create timestamp, the container runtime, the OS images, and CPU memory capacity, whether the node condition is under memory or disk pressure or not. All these things are listed clearly here through the ECAS console. And um, you can also see in the workload here, you will see the flux controller listed and running with the number of replicas there. So, Next, um, I'd like to show you how we can manage this cluster with GitOps, like the real magic part. Specifically in this demo, I want to scale up the number of worker nodes and also change some resources back in this worker node group. So after we run the create command, the CLI will automatically clone and sync the Git repository we define in the cluster config to the local machine where we ran this command. So we just cd into the git repo. Um, the file structure is pretty straightforward. Under the cluster directory, we have the cluster name. In my case, it's EKS a demo. And under my cluster, we have two subdirectories, the flux and EKS a system directory. So the flux directory carries all the dis uh, declarative config being used to deploy flux controllers and the EKS A directory simply has our clusters back in that. So the only thing we need to do is we want to just bim into the EKS A spec and do some editing there. So here I want to update the worker node con from one to three to scale it up. And uh, scrolling down here, I also want to um, move these nodes to a separate folder to better distinguish them from the control plane nodes. And I also cut the memory for each node to have for the demo purpose. I save it and commit. Then push the changes to the Git repo. And that's literally it. We can now just sit back, grab a beer or tea, and let Flux and EKS a controller to do the rest of the work for us. So, um, but let's still go back and check what exactly is happening 
in the cluster behind the thing. So you will see here in Flux customization, the Flux system status changed from ready to reconciliation in progress. And if we check the customization controller log, um, you will see here the cluster as well as the vSphere machine config just got configured. And it says the reconciliation finished with the latest git commit we just made before. And if we check the EKS8 cluster spec again, you will notice here the replica number for worker nodes already got updated. And also the same thing happened for the worker nodes vSphere machine config. That is because Flux controllers detect the Git repo code changes and applies it on the cluster resource immediately. Then um, the EKSA cluster controller we developed reconciles the changes made in the spec and updates the underlying cluster API template, which triggers the scaling and update process. You can see the logs clearly here. So um, after that, we can simply run the get machines again. You can see the new worker machines are being provisioned. The cluster API is doing the scaling up and updating operation and try to provision new nodes on vSphere. And for us, we just need to wait for probably five minutes or something to have the new nodes to come up. And if we run the kubectl get nodes again, you will see all the three worker nodes are, are up and running. Same thing for the pods. And we can always go back and check the VSphere UI again. You will see here, the new worker nodes are successfully running in the EKSA demo workers node now, as what we specified in the Git repo. And same thing for the EKS console. You can see all the new nodes just created three minutes ago and are running in ready state. And that's all about the demo. It's pretty short and hopefully straightforward. Really, I think as a user, the only thing you will need to do again is to push your code changes to the Git repo. And for EKS Anywhere, we truly believe a good product requires minimal efforts from the user. We want our user, whether it's a Kubernetes admin or developers, to be able to interact with our product using the tools they already been using on a daily basis. And in this case, it is Git. And um, really, I think thanks to Flux, we are able to provide a very smooth and simple user experience to let our users manage their EKS Anywhere cluster in a native way through a Git repository. So um, yeah, thanks all for listening. Again, really glad to be here today. If you have any questions, really feel free to ask us through the Slack channel or just shoot me an email at joeyuan at amazon.com. We will be really happy to hear from you. Thank you. Thank you guys so much. That was awesome. I actually learned a lot. Um, so I do have a question, if that's okay. Um, so. Uh, I, ah. I, I see it in the in the Slack chat. It's right. uh, the EKS a require connection to AWS. Um, so the answer is um, no. Um, you, we are working on like some fully air-gapped features where we can bundle up all the images and components. And you know, if you want to like burn them on an unwritable DVD or whatever, you can do that. But um, in about two or three weeks, when we do our next release, we're also releasing support for uh, private registry. So you can bring the images down and put them in your own container registry uh, on-prem and it doesn't require any connection to AWS. We also didn't take any hard dependencies with any AWS components. Um, having said that, if you wanna take advantage of EKS console, which is a, a, a feature we launched or a new feature product, I guess, we launched in preview a couple months ago where you can 
basically get a single pane of glass for all your Kubernetes clusters, um, then you obviously need uh, you need a, a AWS connection to do that, obviously. Uh, but to run EKS anywhere clusters, you don't you don't need any connection to AWS. Um, and then I think another one is is Flux integrated so integration supported with EKS anywhere on developers' laptop? Yes. So during this demo, I was using my on Mac laptop. So pretty much we're building a command line. It's just a binary. You can build pretty much on anywhere. You can run it on Linux machine, on Mac OS or whatever admin machine you are using. Awesome. Um, I think you already answered the EKS anywhere CRDs use cat. Do they use cluster API to provision the clusters? Yep, that's correct. Okay. And then, um, Personal one, can I still use Cube Control to manage my clusters, like updating the EKS Anywhere resources and expect the cluster to reconcile? Yeah, so technically, yes, you can, but we would not recommend that. I know by default, Flux prevent drift by restoring the cluster to the desired state in the latest commit configuration every minute. And the reconciliation itself can be suspended completely, although this is not the recommended way. So. If the reconciliation is enabled by default, any change made to the cluster using kubectl added or kubectl patch will be reverted. When the uh, reconciliation is disabled, change using kubectl will remain the same until the next update to the Git repo. But the recommended way is always to only commit changes to the Git repo and let Flux do the rest. Um, of course, you can manually do these changes to kubectl, but the whole point of GitOps is to better manage our infrastructures to uh, a de declarative and version controlled way. If you do manual changes, you will not get the benefit of version control PRs and the single source of truth over your stack. Makes sense. Um... I think we have a question that was also plus one. Uh, can you describe the flow again for cluster API? Uh, they say first it starts on the bootstrap cluster, then it- Yeah. Yeah, you got it. <laughs> yeah, so so you you have a bootstrap cluster where we, uh, with a kind cluster, we actually install the cluster API resources on that. And then we use that kind cluster to bring up your actual target cluster that you want. Um, and then we move the resources to that target cluster and then get rid of the local kind cluster. We're in, in a couple of releases or very shortly, we're also releasing support for what we would call like a management cluster where you would still go through that flow to, to bring up your first cluster, but that initial target cluster you bring up um, could turn into like a management cluster. And then you could use interact with that to bring up your actual workload clusters. But today the workload clusters are self-managed. So the CAPI resources get put on the actual workload clusters themselves and they're, they're self-managed, but we're, we're working on a flow where you can actually stay on a management CAPI cluster and then use that to bring up your workload clusters and, and control the life cycle of your workload clusters over time. Awesome. And I think just a bit of love for Joey um, on the on the channel. Uh, it says, Joey, your terminal theme is awesome, <laughs> which is great. Thank you. <laughs> all right. Um, I think that's all I saw. Uh, thank you guys so, so much for taking the time to come do this talk. This was awesome. Thank you for having us. Appreciate it. Thank you.